Mr. Mabel. Come on out of here, honey. Uh, for, uh, you know everybody? There's Mabel for everybody. Uh, All right, Mabel. 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 Mabel's not crazy. She's unusual. Tell me what you want me to be, how you want me to be. I can be that. I can be anything. You tell me, Mabel. Mabel's a delicate, sensitive woman. And the reason I'm worried is that uh, you've been acting a little strange. Uh, uh, I, I wonder if you've been aware of that or not. This is what I call a really handsome face. That's enough. Okay, come on, let's dance. No, no, no. no. Look at this I That's never enough. saw such muscles. I bet he didn't fit in a suit. Maybe. Come on. Yeah. You had your fun enough. Vito Grimaldi. Get your ass down! Welcome to The Shabby Detective, yet another Columbo podcast. I'm your host, Mike White. Joining me, of course, is Mr. Chris Stashew. I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say, yes, this is another Columbo podcast. I don't know how many of the other Columbo podcasts went. We're going to cover Cassavetes' movie that has Peter Falk in it because, yes, John Cassavetes was in the beginning of the last season, but folks, buckle up. <laughs> well, hell, Columbo money paid for this movie, which is pretty good so i i see a good tie-in and yeah peter falk kiss Betty's. i'm not saying there's no good reason to watch it yeah no and plus what's more falk and i'm all about more falk please even in that goofy hat hey man i don't know that hat's pretty great no the hat's great and what really gets me is that it was cassavetes that picked out that hat and not falk because Falk has this whole thing in Wings of Desire where he's trying on all these hats and he just keeps talking about, like, if you find the hat, you find the character. And I'm like, okay. And this hat, I think, definitely makes this character in Woman Under the Influence. Yes, we are talking about Woman Under the Influence or A Woman Under the Influence released in 1974. It is an American drama written and directed by the one and only John Cassavetes. Stars his wife, Gina Rollins. And his best pal, Peter Falk. And it is a harrowing tale of Mabel Longetti, who is a housewife and mother who is a little off, but not, I wouldn't say she's totally nuts. You wouldn't, but everybody else in the movie would. Everybody else wants to, yeah, say that she's nuts, including her husband, who is played by Peter Falk. And yeah, he ends up institutionalizing her for six months and she comes back and she's a changed woman, but then he wants her back to the way that she was. They have a big fight, one of many, and then the movie kind of ends. Falk's character's name is Nick, but I'll probably call him Peter Falk through almost this whole thing. But Nick and Mabel are our main characters here and Gina Rollins. She is 
freaking amazing in this movie. Luckily, she is because she carries this whole damn movie on her shoulders. And so much of it are long, long takes of her. And you just watch the expressions on her face. It kept me entertained for over two hours, which I didn't think I would say about this. Was this the first time you'd seen this? First time. Yes. I, for some reason, I don't know which, I know I've seen Killing of a Chinese Bookie, and I think I tried to watch Minnie and Moskowitz, but John Cassavetti's movies are just not my bag. I have all the respect in the world for Cassavetes and what he was doing and what he was trying to do, and I think successfully doing, but it is just not my flavor. Before we started talking and recording, we were talking for a long time about chicken tenders, and you might really love chicken tenders from Canes or something. What's it called? Raising Cane? Raising Canes, which is the name of a dog. And then really might like them from Popeyes, but if you don't like Popeyes, if it's not your flavor... I'm not going to make you eat Popeye, so please just don't make me sit down and watch a lot of Cassavetes, especially a lot of Cassavetes at once. Maybe if I was stuck in a movie theater, I would be able to handle these a little bit better, but just the pacing and what he's doing and letting these actors act. Like, I really love that he lets these actors act and find their characters and just duke it out and everything. There's probably a script someplace, but I think it's much more of find your character, find your feelings, and let that dictate where the story's going to go. That's fantastic, but it's just so not me. Was this your first Cassavetes, or had you seen other stuff? First Cassavetes, so there is that. And then let's talk about something here. This is something that I think would be appreciated more now by a certain subsect of people, but I don't think that they would fully appreciate it because it doesn't scratch the itch completely. It only scratches about half of the itch. This movie is beyond uncomfortable, beyond, beyond uncomfortable in a way that it verges on black humor and verges onto that point of when people say, I wish I could be a fly on the wall in the room. This is the last fucking room I'd want to be a fly on the wall in. And I say it would scratch the itch of a certain subsect of people if it were a little bit further in the direction of comedy, because this, for me, at times was like watching an unfunny, drier than dry series version of Meet the Parents. It's like a group of people that cannot figure out a way to get along are forced to be in a room with one another. And it's so uncommon. The later half of this movie is essentially one long dinner party scene. And it got under my skin and made me want to rip my skin off and run down the block screaming. It's so unbelievably uncomfortable but there's no comedy in it. It's like you mentioned, it's so matter of fact, played straight. Again, it's a, meant to be reality in the room with these people that, yeah, this is my first Cassavetes movie and it very well may be my last. And look, I'm not going to drag the movie anymore beyond this opening salvo that we're having here. But this movie for me is so uncomfortable and so intentionally intolerable for the reasons that it's trying to be and it succeeds at that that i would have a hard time suggesting anybody watch this movie because it only should be for the kind of person who wants to see this kind of thing because like you've mentioned if you start watching this and it's not your thing you're you got nowhere to go for two and a half hours oh by the way can i just mention also here at the top cassavetti's brevity is the soul of wit pally like it is this is an hour too long and that's being generous. I think he's doing it on purpose and that whole thing of being uncomfortable. What's better than being uncomfortable for two and a half hours rather than for 90 minutes. Yeah. Oh, yo, here's this dinner lunch scene with Peter Falk and all the people that he works with. And it goes on for 35 minutes. There's no editing here intentionally. Like there's editing, but it's not, it's editing as in you're seeing just a different perspective. It's not a jumping of time. Everything is more or less in a lot of these scenes played chronologically in real time. It's, that's the other thing. It's exhausting to watch something that's being played out in real time. Cause it's just, they, they, some of this shit's not important. Why are you showing us every wart and nook and cranny of this scene? Like it's just, 
sometimes I don't need to see it, but I get that that's Cassavetes' thing. 100%. I think I liked that part of it more than you did, but I was still just like, okay. Like when she's out on the street asking people what time it is, that just seems like it goes on forever. The lunch, brunch, whatever that thing is with all of his coworkers, the spaghetti dinner. Yeah, that goes on for a long time. But for me, that was just Again, just watching her and watching her face, they barely cut back to Falk in that whole sequence. It's more his voice than it is his face, but it's her face and just watching all those little micro expressions play across. Because if it wasn't for her and her performance, I would say this would be fine as a play. And I know that he wrote this as a play at first, I actually wrote it as three plays. And when he showed it to Gina Rowland, she was just like, there's no way I could play this like every night to do just one of those things. It would probably be like you're saying, like the big chunks. You've got the breakfast, the spaghetti breakfast going on. You've got the birthday party, quote unquote. You've got the big party at the end. It's so odd. All of these are big gatherings. The way you're describing Cassavetes, letting these things play out and the cutting and all this. If you added humor, I think you would get Altman. But there is none of that. Or even Foreman. Because that's what I was also thinking about when when we were talking earlier this year about taking off. It has that same quality. of, And that's the thing you mentioned. You liked it more than I did. I liked, it's not that I disliked what he's doing. I disliked certain times when he did it over others. But that's the thing. It's like there are things that could be taken whole cloth out of this movie and it would not affect my ability to enjoy the movie because that's the thing. I might have said this movie is exhausting and it's very, not cringe. I don't want to use the word cringe. It's uncomfortable. Cringe is a different thing. I enjoyed this movie. It's not a, can we just have a conversation real quick about, is this an appropriate and realistic representation of mental illness? And what is the mental illness? Other is It's meant to be bipolar, I'm assuming. It's meant to be something very, a very drastic mental illness that needs to be would be now treated probably with mood stabilizing drugs, but at the time it's being treated with, we'll get to it when we get to it. But what is this an appropriate representation of mental illness in film? Cause that's the whole movie. I've known people like this. I might have been like this at times in my life when I was going through more of a manic phase, but yeah, th- this rings, it rings true to me, especially all those little looks on her face and that she is never slowing down. Her brain is always going this whole time and she gets fixated on things and the way the forgetfulness, I'm not sure about that, but that could also be due to alcohol. Like when she brings the guy home at night and I don't know if they end up sleeping together or not, I'm guessing no, but I can't really tell. Indeterminate as far as I could tell. If you think of it either way, it adds some nuance to her character, but felt that it was pretty accurate and just the, yeah, the lack of understanding and just that Nick wants her to be one way. Her mom wants her to be another way. Nick's mom definitely wants her to be another way. And she is just herself going through this, having this period of her life and no one seems to give a rat's ass about her or what she wants or how to make her better. Even her own family, which is, the, which is just, uh, you, won't you stand up for me? It's like four actual fuck's sake movie. And it, when it goes there in that moment, it is so earned. And to your point, that's the thing, the title, a woman under the influence. It's, you could read it so many ways, alcohol, like we've mentioned under the influence of a society that at the time, and still the term histrionics comes from, that is what we're talking about is hysterical women. And that term is why we don't use that term anymore is because histrionics just, it's not a great term because it's literally about women, crazy women. Yeah. And their actual body parts. Also that. It's just, it's under the influence of what is the ultimate question and it's society Is it her husband? Is it the expectations of society? Is it the expectations of her mother-in-law, her mother, and her family? 
It's all of those things. And that's what makes it so interesting. And that's why they give all these scenes so much time is because you have to see all of those things working on top of who she is to really push down on her. She is under, under, beneath the influence. She's being pushed down and pressed down and squeezed by the influence constantly. And yeah, it's about a woman with mental illness, but I ultimately don't really think it is in a lot of ways. Like it is, but it isn't, right? Because there's so much other things going on that the mental illness seems to be more of a catalyst for all the things to continue to happen because you would assume someone who maybe didn't have overwhelming amounts of mental illness like her character does might be able to handle those things but there are so many things going on in this movie that i think anybody would have a hard time balancing all these things which is what ultimately the movie kind of gets at is this is not hard it's impossible but you have to keep at it i'm always looking for more subtext to things but a movie like this it's so just on the surface and in your face there probably are things that are deeper but the surface is so repellent that i don't want to even dig deeper we're talking about like other movies that this movie right might remind us of or this filmmaking style it really feels like all those mumblecore movies took all their stuff from cassavetes and just didn't know what to do with it those movies are the was it cinema of confrontation type of thing, or just like cinema of apathy? This movie has so much more emotion than any of those movies that I managed to make my way through. But again, it's like those movies are tough to watch mostly because the people are insufferable. This one's tough to watch just because these situations are so real and raw and all the emotions are just, this film feels like it's just a raw nerve. And it's constantly being poked, too. And that's the thing. And Peter Falk's character, he's an interesting character because times he comes off as a progressive husband who is very much in his wife's camp and he has her back seemingly. But then there are those times where he snaps and he snaps in ways that, again, like he smacks the shit out of her a couple times. And again, I laugh only because they have to go as far as they do, because otherwise you would really not... Like you said, there's no subtext here to this movie. There is, but the subtext is hard to get to, like you mentioned, because of how just the movies refuse to let you enjoy this movie. (laughs) I refuse to let you enjoy what's going on. Don't find entertainment in this. Don't find joy in this. But there's something to be said for that, because that in a lot of ways cuts to the idea of cinema reflecting real life, not real life being reflected in cinema like cinema is this movie is really trying to just be what people women in america may have been going through and at the time maybe not specifically what they were going through at the time is more what the movie's trying to get at but it has to really put it into the biggest proportions possible because again it's a movie i'm thinking about the women or just the people that saw this in 1974 and saw themselves in this. And then I think about the people that were being, again, ignored or just kept out. I don't know if Gina Rollins is actually crazy. She just might be a flighty person. She might just have a different sense of humor sometimes. I love when she has that moment with her kids where she's asking them, do you see me? And do I look sad or do I look angry or just all the questions she's asking? And they're like, no, we just see you. But she's thinking about how other people might perceive her. So she's self-aware of these things. She knows that she's presenting as off, quote unquote. But how much of that is people putting that on her? People are being under the influence of her family, of her husband, of society. I hate to go to that big of a term, but it's Here we are, 1974, folks. First wave feminism, I think, is still going on, and that is being seen as this attack on the system. Gina Rollins is the mom. She's had three kids so far. She's trying to have this romantic evening with her husband, who then stands her up. Just make a freaking phone call, Nikki. What are you doing? But yeah, I, I don't know if that, what, she expresses is just normal and just maybe a little different. I'm a little different, but I wouldn't say that I need to go 
away for six months and have electroshock therapy. And that's the thing. That's why I mentioned, is this a movie about mental illness or is it just, is it just a woman who is like so put upon, so constantly being expected to do so much constantly, the expectations outweigh the ability to exist. And it's, that's not mental illness. That's just the expectations of the society that we live in. And in 74, they were lower than what they are even now. You could make this movie now and really talk about all kinds of wild things like social media and how that affects people. Because this is your representation and belief of yourself is pretty easy to understand in 74 when there's no social media, which allows you to have fake personas or a fake outward expression of who you are. Because again, then you can hide behind that. That's the thing about this movie that is so great is that it did come out at a time where you can't hide behind anything. That's the other thing. There is no hiding in this movie. There's no hiding. Gina Rollins is constantly out in the open. Everything that goes on, everybody else sees, other than the kind of couple interactions between her and Peter Falk. But even then, it's like the kids are still there. Somebody is seeing what's going on. But that was the thing I kept trying to square away with my feelings with this movie. It's like, is this a mental health movie? And it is... But I also think it's more just about society and the expectations of other people are so hard to meet that we end up driving ourselves crazy, as one might say, trying to meet all those expectations. Like when the guy comes over to their house for the birthday party and she's just, I don't know what she's doing. My read of that scene might be different than yours, but I felt she was just being a mom, just being goofy because there's a bunch of kids. But he like reads it as she's drunk and out of her head and stuff and it's so my point come back to my point of what is the movie getting at and i think it's less about mental health and more just about like expectations and meeting people's expectations are so fucking hard it's almost not even worth doing frankly and that whole freak out about the little girl that didn't have enough clothes and stuff i'm just like aren't you haven't you ever been around kids kids take their clothes off all the time and run around like savages I've been at Disney World and seen a naked child run by. And that's like out in public with plenty of other people. Uh, Yeah, it's, I don't know. And that's the thing. Maybe in a lot of ways, like Cassavetti goes a little too far. But I don't know. Respect someone who says, I don't want to make something that leaves any question as to what the fuck I'm talking about. Appreciate that. Look, if Casavetes were here right now talking with us, we know the kind of person that he is just by the kind of movies that he makes. He walked to the beat of his own drum and that drum was being beaten by him. And he would not let anyone else beat the drum. And that's okay. Peter Falk was very much the same way. I think what's funny is we're watching this because we're talking about Columbo, but Peter Falk really is good in this, but I don't think he's any better than anybody else could have been. Right? Everybody seems to be given their all. Even so many of these people are just obviously non-actors, but it works. It works really well. His co-workers, some of the family members. You've got Gina Rollins' mom in here and Cassavetti's in here. I don't know if either of them were trained actors, but they sure are given hell of a performance, both of them. The lady Rollins, Gina's mother, she just looks so uncomfortable when folks like, oh, come on, get into the bed and all this. She's just like, oh. I'm fine. I'm fine. He's crazy too. When you think about it, just the way that he's, he obsesses about things and you're supposed to have a romantic time with your wife. You don't show up. You're down fixing the water main. You show up with the 12 apostles in tow. And she just wanted to have you just wanted you, Nick. And you do this and why wouldn't she have a weird response to that? Because that was a shitty thing to do, Nick. You mean showing up when your wife expected just you with all your pals to then have them have a dinner cooked for them at like two in the morning? Or I guess it wouldn't do it like six in the morning, let's call it, whatever. Like it's so early that it's like, when the fuck is going on? After they essentially were like, oh, your wife's crazy. Let us see your crazy wife. Yeah, that's the thing. Peter Falk's character in this movie It's weird because he's meant to be sympathetic and progressive, but then, like I mentioned, he does all these kind of violent things. I don't think he's supposed to be sympathetic. The sympatheticness wears off so quickly that by the end of the movie, I'm like, what is he? Other than just her husband. That's the thing. It's what does he have to be other than that? Right. 
he is not better than anybody else in this movie. I still contend Gina Rollins is just amazing. And he doesn't hold a candle to her. He's just there. But he's serviceable. He's more than serviceable. He is doing a great job because he has to act against all of these other people and does a great job with that. The hat definitely lends a lot of character when he's in that role. You love that hat. Columbo should wear that hat. <laughs> Columbo in a hat's just a bridge too far. And I don't think, I think it would clash with the trench coat. I love, there was an interview with a French reporter who was talking with Peter Falk and it was for, I think it was, Falk was promoting a woman under the influence in Paris. And so this French guy is asking him all these questions and hey, Columbo, Peter Falk is wearing the trench coat. And the guy's, oh, do you take your trench coat everywhere? And it's, hey, yeah, I put it, put out a bowl of milk for it every night. And the French guy just had no idea what the hell was going on. But he was, folks says himself that he's not a sympathetic character. And I'm just like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it's, it's not because the idea of have this wife who I talk about as saying she's crazy, but then I try to tell people not to say she's crazy, who then I, in, believing that she's crazy, take her and institutionalize her for six months. And then when I get her back, I don't like the fact that what was supposed to happen did happen, seemingly, that I now then implode everything to try to get that back is it's not a sympathetic character. And yeah, anybody other than Peter Falk could have done it. But yeah, I'm glad it was Peter Falk because he's great in this movie. But he's a yeah, he's a bizarre character because, again, you feel like he has her best intentions in mind, at least theoretically, but the way he goes about doing things is just, he's not any better of a parent than she is. It's just he can internalize and compartmentalize things a little bit better than she can, I think is what the movie more or less gets at. You do what every man does. You just bury your feelings. Push it down until you murder your family. If this turned into a family annihilation film, I wouldn't have been shocked. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Falk is the family annihilator. <laughs> He's murdering his kids and then dumping them into an oil well. Yeah. The thing about this movie is the way the movie goes, the direction it ends up heading, that these people either need to not be together or they're going to murder one another eventually. And those kids are probably going to be in between it. That's, that is the hard truth of a movie like this. So these people are so hard to be around and the movie is so abrasive that I really don't care what happens to them. The way I see this ending is that they've had this blowout. They're back together. They're making that bed. They're going to go on with their lives just normal for six months. And then this whole thing's going to happen again. And then It'll go on for another six months and it'll just continue on for the rest of their lives until one of them dies. I'm wondering something about the way the movie plays some certain scenes. And again, to speak back to the idea of what is the, is it a mental health thing or is it a woman just trying to like disguise herself and exist within this construct that society places on her? My, my favorite moment in the entire movie is when they're all sitting at the table at this, this fucked out party that is that puts texas chainsaw massacre to shame with the amount of weirdos sitting around the table uncle adolf and gina rollins gets up and goes into the other room while she's been acting quiet and unlike herself and all of a sudden she starts acting very much like the way she was before and you see all these shots of people's faces and they're just like, like they can't understand what's going on and i'm i genuinely feel like that's one of those scenes where it's like they're more or less getting at the idea that she is having to pretend constantly now. She knows that everything she does is under a microscope and she just didn't realize that they could hear her in the other room. But the veil drops for that moment and then she walks back in and she starts acting, quote, strange again, unquote. But it's that see that that moment of like all their faces and they're just like all very weirded out because again, they even they're not sure what's going on with her. Yeah. You know what? I, I changed my mind. I think I'm going to watch more Cassavetti's films. Because as we talk about this, I'm just like, yeah, that worked. That scene really worked and worked well. Man. Yeah. It's it's beyond uncomfortable. But again, like, it's uncomfortable in a way that taking off 
was charming. It's like this movie wants to traffic in being uncomfortable. And that comes with, yeah, using non-actors. The person, not actor, the person who plays Eddie Shaw, who plays Dr. Zepp, just so weird. Just a weird guy. Peter Falk will talk to him and he'll be like, yeah, are you great? You're right. And it's like, who the, who are you? Just, yeah, it's, yeah, I don't know. Like using non-actors allows the movie to feel even stranger because it just, there's something that non-actors bring to a movie that you can't replicate real people. So you just cast real people you know. It's so funny that they're doing what, Falk and Rollins and the other professional actors are trying to do is capture that spontaneity, whereas all these other people are just spontaneous because they don't know what else to do. And I also love that Cassavetes uses a lot of close-ups, especially of Peter Falk and of Gina Rollins. But the close-up work in this movie is, it's pretty on point. Again, having not seen any other Cassavetes movies, I'm assuming this is a thing that he does, but... Yeah, the close-ups in this movie are constant. They're all over the place. And they, again, they work to reinforce how uncomfortable this is. They put you in the perspective of the people who are sitting right there at the table. Yeah, now this is me doing something that I hate when other people do. But Cassavetti's, I want to say it was one of his first movies, was called Faces. I wouldn't be surprised if it was just comprised wholly of close-ups. Having not seen a lot of other Cassavetti stuff, I always assumed that he was like a a film, an independent filmmaker who had a sense of what he wanted and how he wanted to get it. And watching this movie, having been the only exposure, it is very much that this is uncompromising in its vision of what he wants. And man, again, you have an actor like Peter Falk who is so charming for the most part, but when they let him explode and then they let Cassavetes direct those scenes where he explodes. Like, it's just, yeah, it's two friends working together, really nailing something that really had to have a very steady hand going into it. Yeah, otherwise it's just going to blow up in your face. I feel like the length of the movie is where it blows up in the movie's face. Because it, I don't know, to hold my attention for an hour and a half is not hard with this kind of movie, but to hold my attention for two and a half, over two and a half hours... It's exhausted. And maybe that is the point. But by the end of the movie, I was like, I'm done. When the six month time jump happens, there's still like an hour left. And that's a pretty exhaustive point to get to in the movie. Everything that plays out subsequent, basically the second half of the movie is almost entirely that party. Yeah. It's one night. But it just keeps going and going. And then the people leave. And it's just, just good night. It really does feel like a play in that way. That whole, like the first act is all of these different scenes. And the second act is just like the following night or six months later. And it's just the one night with the party and just the little m movements within there. All those people that he's kicking out because he was so stupid that he invited all of his coworkers, all of these people that know her and just want to, to see Mabel and what are you doing, Peter Falk? That right there for me is like one of those moments where he just like, you, hey, motherfucker, you just don't get it, do you? You just don't get it. And that's the thing. Society didn't get it. Well, was it Rosemary Kennedy that was lobotomized because they thought that she was, quote, crazy, unquote? Look, thank God Gina Rowland's character didn't get lobotomized. But there's a version of this movie where they went that far. They... They went about as far as they could have short of doing that by having her essentially hint at that she was given electroshock therapy for every day for six months. Yeah, but it's a pretty fucking bleak movie, even if you're not going all the way to the lobotomy, which I feel like the movie is baiting you into thinking that's what's going on when she initially shows up, that she's been like completely lobotomized. But she's but she hasn't been. But. No, I like that they like they don't outright they do outright say it, but I like that they give it this like narrative moment of her like, well, tell us about what happens when they would electro shock us. And it's, oh, no, I just don't watch these kinds of movies like for good reason. I don't even watch dramas. I don't watch dramas either because, again, real life stuff and touching on these real life interactions with people. If you have to deal with them in real life, it's not something you want to 
subject yourself to in movie form. That's the other thing. And that's the kind of issue that I do take with this movie in terms of the mental health thing. While it doesn't really have anything to say about mental health, it also really, it's not really taking a stand on how to make these situations better. It just wants to wallow in it for two and a half hours, which is fine. But in this day and age, with so many of us having relationships, friends, how family members that do struggle with mental health, this movie not being a positive or negative entry into the canon kind of is a little bit of a missed opportunity. But it, again, in 74, like, who gives a shit? Like, they don't give a shit. That's the point. That's, that is the point. But I would find this movie hard for people to watch in 2023. If I, I feel like people would have a hard time sitting down with this, something more like a marriage story is probably a more 2020-ish approach to something like this. Yeah. And I couldn't watch that one. I just, as soon as I saw the clips, I was like, yeah, don't need to see this. Thanks. It's one reason why I don't watch quite a few Woody Allen movies. Husbands and Wives, I think, is a brilliant movie. But, oh my God, talk about being uncomfortable. And it just was, again, another raw nerve where I'm like, oh, I can't go near this. Yeah, it's like I'm not going out of my way to watch Go Ask Alice or Sophie's Choice. Like, it's stuff like that where you just have to ask yourself, do I want to subject myself to something like this for two and a half hours? And there are people that say, yes, because I can get to see. I enjoy this because I get to see actors being actors, doing what actors really want. If you're really that kind of actor, which Peter Falk really was, and the whole Columbo thing about him. We could have called this the reluctant detective only because Peter Falk was so reluctant to always be Columbo because it ended up being the thing. But that's that's ultimately the thing about this is like you get to see actors acting the way that actors want to act and often only get to do in theater because in theater they're letting them act with a capital A and this is acting with a capital A and if you want that this is a master class in the other things it's going to be a real mixed bag of what you can tolerate what you're already going to want to watch and the things that you like already because like again if you're into these movies, it's not going to be a hard sell, but this is a hard movie to like sell somebody on. Yeah, you'll love it. It's so depressing. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's, hey, you want to watch The Handmaid's Tale? Sure. But I'm going to be depressed the whole time I'm watching. You're right. It's, okay. Yeah, there's a lot of things I just stay away from because I don't want to be depressed. That's why I was like, I don't want to watch Guardians of the Galaxy 3 again makes me cry i really don't want that there's only a few movies that i watch when i say i want a good cry and it's total the hero and umbrellas of shareboard otherwise i don't watch those movies because they're just going to have me in tears yeah for me it's music like i don't listen to certain songs because they make me think of certain things or certain people and it's they elicit, and like with a movie, it's not necessarily immediate, but with music, for me, it's like an immediate emotional reaction, and it's hard to contain it. But with, with movies that, like like yourself, like there are certain movies where it's like, I don't want to watch this. I don't want to watch What Dreams May Come. Yes, that's an easy and obvious pick, but that movie is, like, it, it's emotionally manipulative. That's fine. There are movies that are allowed to do that, because the movie is not earning it it is earning it and it's you're allowed to be emotionally manipulative if you earn it this movie i think earns it again it's just who is this for other than just to inform viewers at the time women in the 70s are having a rough go of it but guess what women in the 2023s are having a rough go of it too that has never changed it's just what we're talking about has changed yeah it's just oppression in different forms Look at all the women's health issues that are going on right now. No right to their own bodies. It's the same shit that was going on. That's why the first wave of feminism, one of the reasons why that came about. Right. And, and that's the thing, watching movies from the 70s about cop brutality. It's it's changed, but it hasn't. But it hasn't. And that's the same thing here. It's The conversation about mental health has thankfully gotten way further down the road. It's much more acceptable now to talk about it. It's less Rosemary Kennedy being lobotomized and kept a secret forever because the family's ashamed of whatever the fuck they're ashamed of. Thankfully, we've come further, but yeah, 
this again, this movie is just so relentless in its abrasive quality that you yeah, look, it's not easy to find, but it is on HBO Max or Max, whatever it's called, because it is on Criterion. So again, like there is value seen to this movie. Things aren't released on Criterion for no reason. Not everything has a reason. But ultimately, again, if you want to watch a movie where actors are being given the opportunity to act, namely Peter Falk, there is a lot of value in it. And it's Cassavetes and Falk working together. And you're going to see at least, you'll see at least two actors from this movie come back in Columbo. And the first one is Gina Rowland's. The second one, I'm going to let be a surprise. I was curious who the second one is, but I was hoping that the first one was Gina Rowland's. Because that's the big takeaway for me from this movie is I hope to God Gina Rowland's is in Columbo somehow, because that would be great. (laughs) Yeah, if memory serves, it's not one of the better episodes, but... I'm willing to try it again because it's been a few years since I've seen it. Is is she the murderer or murder e? Neither, which is the, the big missed opportunity. Given that they gave Cassavetes the murderer role in the opening of the second season of Columbo, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. yeah. And their pal Ben Gazzara is going to be all over this stuff as well, so... You'll be seeing, I think he shows up in the director's chair at least one time in the third season. And then I think Roland comes in the fourth. But yeah, so for folks listening at home, we are just about to kick off the third season of Columbo. We're going to be back next month with a look at the episode Lovely But Lethal, directed by our friend from Night Gallery fame, Jeanette Zwerk. So he is... Or what was he going by in that last one? Just Sean, John Swark. I get Father Malone. He's he's the Geno Swark apologist. <laughs> the big time Geno Swark apologist. Hey, it is also Night Gallery, which, you know, it's Night Gallery. If you're Night Gallery, folks, then you know. <laughs> I have yet to be really impressed by his work, but we'll see. Vincent Price shows up in the first episode of the third season. Big heap and helping of... Vincent Price for you there, Chris. So until we come back and talk about Lovely But Lethal, what are you working on, sir? Yeah, just weirding way media stuff. So uh, if you want to join us weird, if you want to be a weirdo and join the Weirding Way Media army that we're building to fight Voldemort, go over to weirdingwaymedia.com where this show, the Night Gallery show that we work on, Midnight Viewing, which is Father Malone's show, but yuck it up. We ding dong yuck it up over there on that show. And then we do our own thing. We have a Kolchak show, Barney Miller show, all things you can find at weirdingwaymedia.com. And yeah, what about you, Mike? What keeps you up at night? What keeps you busy throughout the day? Oh, throughout the day? Well, I work a day job. It's a little dry, but sometimes you might find me hiding away in like a conference room and I might be editing some episodes at the projection booth. So Shh, don't tell my boss, please. So you can find the Projection Booth at projectionboothpodcast.com or projection-booth.com. They both work. That's what I'm doing. But until we come back to talk about another season of Columbo, I want to thank everybody for listening. I want to thank John Walker for our intro and Colin Gallagher for our outro. And yeah, thank you, Chris. It's been a pleasure talking about a very uncomfortable movie. I feel like this is one of the episodes of a podcast that we've done together where one of us just wanted it to be over. (laughs) Maybe both, maybe even both of us, possibly. (laughs) 